Hello, I'm Pastor David, and I'm so glad that you are watching today's program. I'm teaching and preaching about prayer. God honors and answers the prayers of a righteous man's heart. I ask you to listen and obey God's word as he speaks to you. Beware of practicing your righteousness before men to be noticed by them. Otherwise, you have no reward with your Father who is in heaven. So when you give to the poor, do not sound a trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, so that they may be honored by men. Truly I say to you, they have their reward in full. But when you give to the poor, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving will be in secret, and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. When you pray, you are not to be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners so that they may be seen by men. Truly I say to you, they have their reward in full. But you, when you pray, go into your inner room Close your door and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you are praying, do not use meaningless repetition, as the Gentiles do, for they suppose that they will be heard for their many words. So do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. Pray, then, in this way. Our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. For if you forgive others for their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, then your Father will not forgive your transgressions. Thank you, Father. Thank you that we can pray. Thank you that you hear us when we pray. Thank you that you answer prayer. We ask you as your disciples asked you long ago, teach us to pray. Teach us to pray. Holy Spirit, I ask you to help me to speak your word, to preach with the power and authority that comes from your spirit, and to teach as you would teach, that men and women can hear, receive, understand, and obey. I thank you for your word now, in Jesus' name, amen and amen. You may be seated. Pray first. Turn and look at somebody next to you and just say to them, pray first. Pray first. Today I'm speaking about the type of prayer that God answers. The type of prayer that God answers. If you don't hear anything else I say, if you don't remember anything else from this morning, I hope you will remember this simple truth. God honors and answers the prayers of people with righteous hearts. I want to say that again, because this is the main thing that I want you to hear today. God honors and answers the prayers of people with righteous hearts. God's looking for righteous hearts. Lots of people pray. But most people's prayers go unanswered. The publicans... The scribes and the Pharisees of Jesus' day claimed to be uh, very religious people. 
they prided themselves that they knew the law of Moses and that they obeyed it down to the very smallest jot or tittle. They stood publicly and prayed loud prayers. They prayed often. But there was no one that Jesus criticized any louder nor rebuked any firmer than the scribes and the Pharisees who prayed loud prayers. And he made it quite clear that their loud prayers and their many prayers would go unanswered by a holy God who looks for righteous hearts. God answers and honors the prayers of people who pray from righteous hearts. Today I want to share with you four important points that I hope you can remember. First of all, prayer from a hungry heart. Secondly, prayer from a humble heart. Thirdly, prayer from an honest heart. And fourthly, prayer from a holy heart. Number one, prayer from a hungry heart. I want you to notice how this chapter starts. Chapter 6, verse number 1. Beware of practicing your righteousness before men. In the last verse of chapter 5, Jesus encourages men and women, he encourages us to live righteous lives. In fact, he says... Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. In other words, be complete in all of your righteousness. But he immediately follows up that command by saying, Be careful that you um, don't practice righteousness hypocritically. Read it again. Beware, Beware of practicing your righteousness before men to be noticed by them. On one hand, God commands us to pursue righteousness, to be righteous, to do righteous things. On the other hand, he says, be careful that you're not doing them for the wrong reasons, out of an impure motive or out of impure hearts. But nonetheless, pursue righteousness. Because when you pursue righteousness, God will honor your prayers. Matthew 5, 6. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are they who hunger. Say hunger. 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 This morning, probably 15 minutes or so before my alarm was to go off, I woke up with a thought so strong in my heart, hungry, hungry. My family, mom and dad, my little sis and I went to India when I was just five years old. Today, India is a very prosperous nation. There are still, frankly, many poor people there, but India's economy is a massively growing economy, and the state of economic affairs in that nation has improved vastly over the, over the last, especially in the last 15 years. But when we went to India in 1965, India was a third world country at best. There were many extremely poor people that lived in that nation. And sometime in the late 60s, there was a a drought and as a result, a famine. And I remember seeing poor people. And I realized that when you're really, really poor and you don't have a lot to eat, you'll get desperate. You see, hunger is, number one, a sign of real need. 
You get hungry. Sometimes I think I'm hungry. I say I'm hungry, and I'm really not, Kevin. I, I know deep down I, I'm not hungry. I'm just, I'm just uh, whatever. I just, you know, I just want a snack. I just want some ice cream. I, I just, you know what I mean. It's just a habit. And, and you can tell by looking at me, there have been very few times in my life where I've really ever been hungry. But I've seen hungry people. And when you really have that deep down gnawing sense of hunger, it's evidence that you need something. I remember seeing little children with bloated bellies extended out not because they were fat, but as a result of malnutrition. Because they were hungry, because they, were, they didn't have satisfactory nutrition, their bodies reacted and, and their very physical appearance was changed because of their need. I've also seen them do strange things. You see, you take desperate measures when you're hungry, when you're really hungry. I, I, I've seen children, I've seen it with my own eyes. Someone eat a banana, and when they finish the banana, they discard the banana peel on the ground. And I've seen children run and grab the banana peel and scrape the white part on the inside. Uh, that that, that uh, stuff that you don't like, that we peel off the banana. I've seen them take and scrape that in their, on their mouths, trying to get the little bit of nutrition that that banana peel offers to them. You see, when you're hungry, you take desperate measures. I believe here in the United States of America, we're living in desperate times. A lot of people don't realize it yet because they're trying to fill up the empty places with things that can never satisfy them and are not spiritually nutritious. But there are many people today in America that are beginning to recognize a spiritual hunger. And I think there's some of us that are sitting here today. There's some who are watching my television even this hour. There are people who are beginning to get spiritually hungry. We're not satisfied with religion as we have known it. We're not satisfied with just going to church. We're not satisfied with just praying a bunch of empty prayers. There's something inside us that is hungry and thirsting after the living God. And I've got news for you that when you get that kind of hungry and you begin to take some desperate measures, you'll get up a little bit extra early in the morning to just call on God. You'll spend a little bit longer at nighttime before you fall asleep in prayer just because you're hungry. You'll come to the church and get in the presence of God and spend hour or hours in the presence of God. Why? Because you're hungry. And when you get hungry like that, Julius, when you really get hungry, God hears honors and answers prayer. Can you say amen? amen. Praise God. <laughs> Secondly, we see in God's word from Matthew 6, verses 5 to 6. When you pray, you are not to be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners so that they may be seen by men. Truly, I say to you, they have their reward in full. But you, when you pray, go into your inner room, close your door, and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Prayer from a humble heart. The scribes and the Pharisees prayed loud, arrogant prayers. But Jesus got alone. As I preached last week, I read to you from portions of Scripture that one place it says he went in the wilderness to pray. Another place says he prayed all night long. He wasn't interested in having men's words of honor. He wasn't interested in having men or women say, oh, that man prays a lot. He wasn't interested in the applause of men. He was only interested in the honor that the Father could show him. He was only interested in the presence of God. He was hungry to hear his Father's voice, and he would get alone with God. Why? Because he had a humble heart. He had a humble heart. I remember we were conducting a, an open-air crusade in a certain city. It was being held in a city park. There were, 
It was not a huge crusade. It wasn't as large as some, but it, there were several hundred, if not a thousand or two thousand people who were present. There was a man that was sitting on the stage that had been a former police officer, fairly highly ranked. He was now a lay preacher and had been invited by the local uh, committee to sit on the stage and was invited to pray, maybe for the offering or at some point before I was introduced to preach, he was invited to pray. I was sitting and quite honestly, I was just meditating and studying and just preparing my heart to preach. And so when he began to pray, he was praying in Tamil, their language, uh, between the fact that I was studying and the fact that I know Tamil, but I'm not completely fluent. If, if, you're, if I'm thinking about something and you're talking, I can still get a little bit. But in Tamil, I have to pay attention. And be honest with you, I wasn't paying attention for a few moments. He just, he was, he was praying. He went on and on and on. And all of a sudden, as I was there, all of a sudden I thought to myself, this man isn't really praying. He's just talking to try to impress the people. He went on for a little while longer and finally... He ended his prayer in a most unusual way, and I won't even tell you because it would take too long to describe how he did it, but when he ended his prayer, it was apparent to not only me, but to everybody there that he wasn't even thinking about his prayer. He was just saying things to try to impress the people. It was very apparent. It's good to pray here. It's good to worship here. It's good to raise your hands in this public place. It's good for us to gather together and, and honor the name of the Lord together in our prayer. And you'll hear me preach more as I go into the Lord's prayer and talk to you about the model. In fact, even yesterday as I was just studying and praying, God showed me something really powerful and something wonderful regarding the nature of our, of our prayers together, our corporate prayer. When we pray together, there's something powerful that happens when we pray together. And so it's a great thing for us to come. It's a good thing for you to raise your hands. It's a good thing for you to express your love and honor to God publicly. But if this is the only place where you're doing it, you're no better than the scribes or Pharisees. If this is the only place where you dance before the Lord, you raise your hands, you sing out loud. If this is the only place where you worship, if this is the only place where you cry tears before the Lord, then there's something wrong spiritually. There's something wrong with your heart. God demands that we have prayers that come from a humble, broken spirit. He says, don't be concerned with other people seeing your prayers. Be concerned that he hears your prayers from a humble heart. Number three, Matthew 6, verse 7 and 8. Matthew 6, verse 7 and 8. And when you are praying, do not use meaningless repetition as the Gentiles do, for they suppose that they will be heard for their many words. So do not be like them. For your Father knows what you need before you ask him, prayer from an honest heart. An honest heart. Jesus says, don't, don't just pray with mere repetition. Don't get up and just say some quoted prayer, some learned prayer over and over again. God's not impressed with, with just religious words, with religious beatitudes. God's not interested in prayers that come from an empty heart, an empty mind. God's looking for people who will pray in spirit and in truth. Did you hear that? Spirit means from the heart and truth from the mind. Don't be praying with either an empty heart or an empty mind. Pray from both a heart and a mind that is concentrated on him and is looking to him in faith. You see, faith that comes out of the heart and is expressed through our minds is a faith that will move mountains. It will move the hand of God. When you pray with faith, God hears and answers that kind of prayer. Pray with an honest heart. 
with an honest heart. Have you ever heard anybody kind of like that guy in my meeting? Oh, gracious, thou most benevolent, almighty creator. And they can pray with big words, but it's just words. God's not impressed by that. There was a Pharisee one day was in the temple praying. He was just loud and obnoxious. Quoting the prayers that he had learned from his fathers and from his teachers. There was another man who had slipped in. Another man who was probably wearing some dirty work clothes whose hands were rough and worn. His hair may have been tousled and wrinkles on his face from a hard life. He stood with his head bowed, embarrassed for anyone to see him. And he prayed, saying, God, have mercy on me. I am a sinner. And the other, seeing him, turned and looked and said, Oh God, I thank you that I'm not a sinner like him. Jesus said, who do you think, whose prayer do you think God heard? You see, you can think that's not a real scenario. It's very real. I'm afraid that I've been guilty of being that guy on occasion. If I'm really honest with myself, I've been guilty of being that guy on occasion. There have been times where I realized that my greatest sin was not lust or lying. My greatest sin was religious hypocrisy. Thinking that I was better than somebody else. When the reality is we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. Be honest with God. Tell him who you are, what you've done. God already knows that you can't hide it anyway. So just tell him what you've done. Amen. Tell him who you are. And God will accept you. Ha! Huh. I could preach for a long time today. Telling you the story of a prodigal son who did absolutely miserably, but he came back to a father who accepted him with open arms. I'm here today to tell you that if you'll just be honest with God, confess to him where you are. Confess to him the bondage that you live in every day of your life. Confess to him the lies that you've told to yourself and you've told to others. Con confess to him the wickedness of the depths of your heart. And when you'll do that, God says, when you call out with an honest heart, I'll hear you. And I'll forgive you. And I will heal you. That's the gracious kindness of our almighty God. Lastly, number four. Chapter six, verses 14 and 15. For if you forgive others for their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, then your Father will not forgive your transgressions. For if you forgive others, for if you forgive others, for if you forgive others. For if you forgive others. For if you do not forgive, your heavenly Father cannot forgive you. You want a clean heart? You want a clean account with God? You want clean records, a clean book? You've got to offer the same to those who hurt you. Was it a daddy? Was it an uncle who abused you? Was it a neighbor? Was it a boss who mistreated you? Was it another church member? 
who ridiculed your name? Was it your mother? Who was it that has hurt you so deeply? You said you've forgiven. You said you've let it go. But not a day passes that you don't remember the pain that they inflicted on you. And you can talk with the religious words. But there's something down inside you that says they ought to face judgment for what they did. See, the reality is, friend, I should have faced judgment for my sin. But God in his mercy says, yes, you've sinned. Yes, you're guilty. But I offer forgiveness to you. On the condition that you're willing to forgive those who've hurt you. And I'm afraid that's where too often church folks get in trouble. We can handle the hungry part. We can at least pretend the humble part. Don't even do too bad with the honest part. But the holy part that reaches out in forgiveness to others, that's the hard part. And I think that's what sometimes keeps me and you from getting our prayers answered. It's what keeps some churches from the glory of God really filling that place. And it's what keeps revival away. When we can't forgive. When we won't forgive. It's not human nature to forgive. That's God's nature. But that's why he gives us his spirit. To help us do what, he, what we can't do. What only he can do. This quiet holy moment. There's some of you sitting here that have denied over and over again that you hold any bitterness, any resentment. You've even said, all I want is justice. Really what you wanted is revenge. Today the Holy Spirit's speaking to you. The Holy Spirit's speaking to you right now, whether it's an ex-husband, an ex-wife, a mom or dad, a boss, previous pastor, or a church member that used to sit near you in this church pew. The Holy Spirit speaking to you now and giving you grace and the opportunity to forgive. And if you'll forgive, he'll look at your heart and say you have a holy heart. And he'll answer your prayers. God honors and answers prayers from righteous people. You say, well, I know I'm not very righteous. No. But he's willing to forgive every sin. He's willing to forgive every sin of your life. And he can make you righteous. And when he does that, whether you're in the public place or the private place, whether you're in a good place or in a desperate place, He'll hear you when you pray. And He'll answer your prayers. God honors and answers the prayers of a man who has a righteous heart. I pray that the Holy Spirit has spoken to you today through His Word. Listen to God and obey what He says to you. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you'll bless this dear one who's watched the TV program. I pray your grace and your anointing upon their life. Help them to listen and to obey, to honor you, and to respect you with their life. Bless them in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm Pastor David Stewart, and I hope to see you at New Life soon.